Good morning, good afternoon, and a warm welcome to this Weidman webinar on a Tuesday in March. Um, we're very pleased to have a huge audience here today. Clearly, this is a topic that's interesting. We're here to talk about insulation concepts to optimize the design of liquid filled transformers. I'd like to welcome, um, in no particular order, we have Brad Greaves joining us from St. Johnsbury, Vermont, USA. We have Jason Bodoin in Montpellier, USA, and we have Tom Prevo dialing in all the way from sunny Florida, um, hence the ceiling fans behind him. Hi, Tom. Um, just a few notes before we start, as usual, if you would like to ask any questions, um, you can pop out using the red arrow to the right of your screen. You will see a tab there called questions. If you click on that and send the question, that will come directly to me. And we hope to have plenty of questions, plenty of interaction from the audience, and we will try our best to get to as many of those as we can at the end of the call. I will say in advance that we have a very high number of people on the call. So if we don't get to your questions, we will come back to you following the webinar and hopefully try and help you out with those. So I apologize in advance if we can't get to them. So with that said, in order to save as much time as possible, it's 10.02 here on the east coast of the US. I would like to hand over to Tom Prevo to start the webinar. Thanks very much, Tom, and over to you. Thank you, Francis. Uh, I'll say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world and are joining us on this webinar. Um, First of all, I'll introduce uh, my uh, co-presenters here. Um, so following me will be Brad Greaves, uh, and Brad is actually controlling the, the slides this morning. So when you hear Jason and I say, Brad, next one, um, that's what we're talking about. And then uh, Jason Baudouin will follow him, and both Brad and Jason work with me in, in our facility in uh, St. Johnsbury, Vermont. So. Uh, yeah, welcome to the webinar. Uh, the intention here is to, at a fairly high level, uh, give you some concepts that can be used to uh, optimize the design of liquid-filled transformers. Uh, Brad, if you can go to the next slide, please. So insulation material, um, so optimize ingredients for solid transformer insulation. Um, next slide, Brad, please. Um, so when we're looking at the insulating material itself, uh, it has some fairly high performance requirements. Uh, from a dielectric standpoint, it has to have high breakdown voltage and low dissipation factor. Uh, power factor is another term used for, for this. Um, from a mechanical standpoint, it has to be very strong. So we'll talk later about one of the criteria, which is short circuit strength. Um, but the material has to have high tensile strength, high flexor strength, uh, also known as beam strength, and then low compressibility. Uh, and then from a thermal standpoint, we need to have a high thermal class and a high degree of polymerization, which is the, the, the length of the cellulose molecule uh, as the, the, the board or paper starts off. Um, the challenge for the board maker or the paper maker is all of these performance criteria can only be achieved using uh, two raw materials, basically water and uh, cellulose pulp. Um, so the, the, particularly the strength and the dielectrics, uh, we have to be very careful about those raw materials. Next slide, please. So from the cellulose standpoint, um, there's, there's two important criteria. First of all, uh, the, the wood that's used from the trees um, should be from softwood trees. These are longer fibers and actually wider fibers that give us uh, our mechanical strength. Uh, and they're also typically sourced, uh, at least for Weidman products, from um, what's called boreal forests. And I, I put this map here in the upper left uh, of the Borea. These are old growth forests typically or in the northern climates um, and because these trees grow so slow we end up getting very very strong uh, fibers for that. Again we can't put any strength additives in, in our material so it's really important to start with with good uh, fiber. 
Um, it's important to, to note that uh, these are coming from sustainable forests. There's uh, the, the pulp suppliers that we deal with are part of this forest stewardship council. Uh, and it, to, in order to be uh, certified, uh, you have to plant two trees for every tree that you harvest. So it maintains a sustainable forest. Um, the other point to, to get a good, pure, strong fiber is when you derive the cellulose from the tree itself, there's a process called pulping, uh, which can, can get those fibers out. And uh, there's, a, there's a pulping process called the craft or sulfate process. And this is the best process. It's the most gentle on the fibers. And again, maintains the, this long length. So two criteria, um, softwood trees from boreal forests, and then the cellulose fibers are derived using the craft process. Next slide, please. The second point, or the second raw material, so we talked about cellulose fibers from the craft process, and the only other ingredient is water. So um, in order to make a good uh, dielectric material, we need to have water with low conductivity, um, low cl chlorides, neutral pH. Um, so uh, if you have an electrical grade uh, um, board or paper plant, then it should be sourced near a good water supply. If you look in the upper right, that's our um, press board mill in Rappersville, Switzerland. The lake you see there in the background is actually the Lake of Zurich. Um, so this is very clean. Uh, water that we use for our processed water. The lower one, this is where um, Brad and Jason are, and I are from, St. Johnsbury, Vermont, and that's a pond that that uh, we get our water from for, for the facility as well. Okay, next, please, Brad. Okay, so the next uh, concept is um, that we want to optimize the space factor in the winding. Um, so the windings uh, for for uh, large power transformers are going to be insulated with a uh, with a craft paper. Um, the when you're doing the design of the winding, you know what the turn to turn stresses are. Um, so you want to uh, to be able to withstand those stresses, and that's determined by the thickness of the paper and the number of layers. Um, once those uh, once that's determined, the space factor of your winding is going to be improved tremendously by how tightly you can wrap these papers uh, onto the conductor itself, which you can see in this photo here. Um, so the the this uh, tightness of the paper is largely determined by the, the strength of the paper. So tensile strength. It's how much force it takes to pull the paper apart. And then another important criteria is elongation. So how much the paper is going to stretch before it, it breaks. And if you can imagine, if you have this high speed wrapping uh, machine, then if you had high elongation, very stretchable paper, then you're able to wrap it much more tightly. So the best conductor insulation will have both high tensiles so it doesn't break, and then high elongation, so it stretches and it can be wrapped very tightly. Next slide, please. So um, how do we achieve that? Uh, one of the processes that uh, actually Weidman acquired from a company called Denison uh, is a, a process called calendaring and creping. So the first process is creping. So if you look in the upper right, that's taking a, a paper and putting it through a process that gives these folds. Uh, if you think of, uh, say, Halloween decorations, you have crepe paper that you use as a decoration. It's very stretchable. Um, however, if, if this was your end result, if you look at the upper right, then you can imagine that the thickness tolerance of this paper would be very broad. So the second uh, process that's used once it's crepe is it goes through a calendaring process. This lower um, right uh, photo is a is a close up of a calendar with with a paper product going through the calendar. So it's two steel rolls that 
come to a nip location and that densifies the, the paper and it also gives you a, a very uniform thickness. So by doing this first, first calendaring, which increases the elongation and then, I mean, first creping to increase elongation and then calendaring, you end up with getting the thickness tolerance of a normal flat non-crate paper, but with the strength and elongation of a paper. And by using that paper, you can uh, you can definitely in, increase the space factor in your windings. Okay, so those are the two concepts that uh, I I would uh, was charged with providing. And uh, from that, I think I'll I'll turn it over to Brad. Great, thank you, Tom. So at this point, we're going to look at the optimized short circuit resilience of the windings. So as Tom mentioned, one of the major aspects for the, uh, the insulation material is for mechanical stability of the windings. And specifically, uh, the role is to support these windings during short circuit events. So in the, the image on the left, if we look at typical transformer forces in uh, core type transformers, the inner winding um, of that transformer will want to, during a short circuit event, uh, pull itself kind of in on itself, both radially and axially, while the outside winding will want to kind of push itself apart in both directions. So one way to ensure that the windings are sufficiently supported, uh, specifically axially uh, in this case, is by selecting the correct material for the radial spacers. And by doing so, you, you select something with the optimal compressibility characteristics. Again, as Tom said, the, the compression or compressibility of this material is critical um, for short circuit resilience. So compressibility can be affected by a, a, a multiple properties. However, most significant is the surface condition of that material. So when we look at uh, compressibility of radial spacer materials, we consider uh, material that has a milled surface pattern uh, or an original unmilled surface with the screen pattern intact. So the images on the right show two variations of, of material. On the left is unmilled uh, or unsurface condition modified material. And we can see in that bottom left photo the screen pattern that is is applied or uh, is created during the manufacturing process. So this screen pattern during the, the process uh, helps to, to compress the material and the drainage and dry the material properly during the pressing. Uh, on the right, or during the, the manufacturing process for radial spacers, that that screen pattern is removed um, to allow for a much more consistent thickness. And also more importantly, the compression characteristics that we are desiring. So uh, you still can see the, uh, the kind of remnants of that screen pattern on the right. However, it is actually almost wholly, uh, completely removed during this, this manufacturing process. So when we look at these materials in the lab, uh, we did some laboratory testing um, of various spacers and sh showed a, a number of different things looking at compressibility. So just for reference, this testing was all completed per the IEC standard. Um, so we're using a, a bedding pressure, an initial pressure of the spacer stack of one MPA, and then compressing that stack up to a, a pressure of 20 MPA and really measuring the difference between those two. So the compressibility on the left-hand graph, we have the three uh, spacer thicknesses, 1.5, 2, and 3 millimeter, all with the milled surface condition, so where that screen pattern had been removed. And on the right-hand side, we are looking at the unmilled spacers where that screen pattern is, is fully intact following, uh, as it was following the manufacturing process. Um, and focusing first on the right-hand side with the screen pattern intact, the unmilled version, we can see a, a big difference or a big impact based on the thickness of the spacer. 
So 1.5 millimeter has significantly more uh, compressibility or compresses much more than when we have, say, a three millimeter spacer. And that is, is really because the screen pattern uh, on each spacer is approximately a quarter of a millimeter. So the, um, the impact on that when you have a 1.5 millimeter spacer is much more than a three. Uh, also, just to note here is that the IEC specification uh, requires a, a maximum compressibility of 1.5 millimeter spacers or 1.5 millimeter material of 10 percent so you can see we're, we're well within the the IEC limits um, being 10 percent for 1.5 and then 7.5 percent on the two and three millimeter so we're well exceeding those but there is this big difference based on the thickness of the material however when we look at the the milled surface spacers uh, we have very consistent results and is really independent of the thickness of the material. So this compressibility is really measuring how much does that material compress under a, a known pressure. And then looking back on the, the right-hand side, where we look at reversible compressibility, this is, is measuring really how much of that compressibility comes back uh, when you remove that pressure. So in the testing process, going from one MPA up to 20 and then back down to one, in an ideal case, uh, you, you would see 100% reversible compressibility. All of what was pressed out uh, returned when that pressure was removed. Uh, similarly uh, to what we saw in compressibility, the unmilled surface, you see a significant difference based on thickness. Um, with the thicker the material, the more reversible that compression. Again, really dictated by the screen pattern um, ratio between the screen pattern and the, the total material thickness. Um, the IEC limits here for the 1.5 is a minimum of 45% of that uh, compressibility has to be reversible. And for two and three millimeter is 50%. So again, well exceeding those, those IEC limits, um, but variable based on thickness. Whereas on the milled surface materials, uh, first we see higher reversible compressibility, meaning more of that, that uh, uh, thickness that was compressed out uh, actually returned and much more consistent with um, between different thickness of spacers. So the next thing we're going to look at is the uh, optimized stress distribution by understanding material permittivity. And here first we look at uh, relative permittivity, uh, otherwise known as dielectric constant, relates the effect of the material on the capacitance of an object compared to air. So when we talk about relative permittiv term permittivity, it is all kind of relative to air, which is one. Transformer oil, is, is around 2.2, while theoretically, uh, pure cellulose is six. We say theoretically because it actually cannot be measured, uh, the dielectric constant of a pure cellulose material. You all, it will always have um, some sort of air uh, encased in the material that, uh, that will be measured as well. So when we look at typical transformer materials, we have listed here a few different uh, options. The low density material is high val, shown here as an approximate density of 0.95 with a relative permittivity of 3.8, while the high density material T4, uh, higher density with 1.2 and also a higher relative permittivity of 4.6. Shown on the, the far right hand side of this table is the oil absorption. And really what we see is the, the relative permittivity of the material is dictated by the, uh, the density, which allows for more or less oil to be absorbed in that material. So for high valve, for example, we, we see a much higher oil absorption, which we have more transformer oil within that or inside of that material, bringing the relative permittivity down compared to that of T4 which absorbs less oil. 
So when we look at how the relative permittivity of the solid material dictates stress, uh, we first need to understand that dielectric stress distributes inversely proportional to the relative permittivity. Uh, showing here the, uh, the calculation method for understanding that, and I don't want to go really into a lot of detail in that, but really just understanding that the, uh, the stress distributes inverse, inversely proportional. Uh, on the right-hand side of this, this slide, just want to show an example of two different uh, systems, one with high-density press board and mineral oil, and the other being low-density. If we refer back to the previous table, we see high-density press board per, uh, relative permittivity of 4.6 compared to low density material of 3.8. All other conditions being the same, the same applied voltage, um, transformer oil still at 2.2, and the dimensions of those materials being the same, we can see that the, the electrical stress within that system has shifted. The, the press board um, in the high density material is 1.3 versus 1.5 in low density material. And the dielectric stress in the oil has shifted when you're using high density material of 2.7 to low density material, uh, a, a stress of 2.5. So, in this example, by exchanging high density material with low density uh, and ultimately bringing the relative permittivity of that solid closer to that of the liquid, that stress is shifted and the stress in the liquid was reduced by 8%. And typically, uh, when you look at uh, transformer designs, the, uh, the fluid is really what will set, or the stress in the liquid is what will set the design clearance. So the ability to reduce that, that stress uh, helps in that regard. So looking at an example, uh, if we have, again, replacing the high-low barriers, uh, between two windings from high density press board T4, exchanging that with low density press board of high valve, resulting in the shift of the stress, um, you ultimately see an increase in the percent margin during the insulation dielectric analysis or IDA. Um, shown here on the left, uh, looking at a field line in the high low space under the uniform field. So not really looking at the effect of the static rings or on the end of the windings, um, but looking in a uniform field area. With T4, in this case, there was a, a negative 1% margin. And simply exchanging that T4 material with high valve, the margin was increased to a 2%. And with that, uh, I will go ahead and hand over to my colleague, Jason. All right. Thank you, Brad. Okay, everybody. Uh, I'm going to cover two topics. The first of which being optimizing, <clears throat> excuse me, optimized dielectric clearances by use of a barrier system. And if you go to the next slide, please, I can show an example. Oh nope, I lied to you. That's the slide after. Uh, the the first way to do this, and and uh, Brad showed us this a little bit on the previous slides where he was showing field plots for dielectric analysis. The there's a way to interpret the oil gaps by use of what's called a Weidman reference curve. These have been <clears throat> used in the industry for many, many years now and have been backed up by uh, lots of practical use and studies uh, across the entire world. Um, now, what's important about this, you can see this is a double logarithmic scale on both the X and Y axis showing the voltage applied, the field strength, on the x-axis and the length of the duct on the y-axis between two electrodes or two barriers. <clears throat> you can see, however, as the duct is uh, increased in length that the strength decreases. Uh, what's important to note is that the inverse of that is true. The smaller the duct, the stronger the gap dielectric strength is for PD inception, PD meaning partial discharge. Next slide, please. Uh, to continue on with some of the imagery that we had previously seen looking at a high-low clearance, uh, so the the winding to the left, you'll see it's kind of a 2D slice through, would represent the low voltage winding, the winding to the right would be the high voltage winding. The first image is, is quite impractical, 
because there are no barriers whatsoever. It's a rather large gap. You can see it's a negative 47% margin. That means uh, at some point, whenever it's negative, that the Weidman reference curve is uh, tells er, the comparison of the stress across that gap to the Weidman reference curve means that they have crossed so that there is actually no safety margin in there. You are very likely to, to see an induction of uh, partial discharge. But if we simply add a few barriers, you can go from zero or negative 47 to a 4% margin just by the addition of three barriers, uh, which is what our bottom uh, imagery is showing. <clears throat> However, again, we're trying to think of these in practical standpoints. Um, so you can't just put any size barriers in. Uh, you need to, to be considerate of what your design may be, what the clearances are, what the individual gaps might say. Um, in this case, 4% is still relatively low. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please, I will show a comparison again. So now what we've done is broken that gap up into smaller ducts using thinner barriers. So we went from three thick barriers to now five thin barriers with a little better control of each of the duct sizes. Uh, in this case, it, that gained us an additional 7% margin just by adding in those few barriers. Uh, next slide, please. So the second topic I'll talk about for uh, optimizing your insulation design is optimizing the surface stress by use of contoured insulation. Please continue. Uh, again, uh, similar to the Weidman reference curves for oil gaps, there is a Weidman reference curve for what's called an oil transformer board surface stress. Uh, we also colloquially, colloquially refer to it as a creep curve because the stress, when you see a failure path, it can creep along the surface. Uh, next, please. All right, the simple imagery here, uh, what we're looking at is the same two coils with some barriers between uh, and some 90 degree segments. Previously, we'd only been showing uh, broken down barriers between or broken ducts with barriers between the coils. Now we've added insulation barriers at the tops of the coils. That would go from the top of the coil up to the core yoke. Uh, in this case here, it's a 90 degree segment. You can see a kind of a thin red line with the letter B telling us where it terminates. The letter A where it begins would be well below the bottom of the screen there. Um, <clears throat> and click next and there we go um, so what this is doing is showing us the stress accumulated along those uh, surfaces um, to go back a little bit and you can sort of see it in the top left view that's not covered wherever those dark black lines what we call equipotential lines cross the surface of the insulation you get a charge accumulation hence the oil press board interface it's where those two touch um, you can see here we can calculate the stress that is accumulated along that interface. And in this case, it's quite a, a low number, 14%. It's not negative, but it's still a low number uh, telling us that there is risk of uh, creep accumulation along the surface of those pieces of insulation. Next slide, please. Now, what we've done is replace the sharp 90 degree interface of those insulation components with what is called a contoured piece of insulation. In this case, we could, we would refer to it as an angle ring. <clears throat> uh, there's other terminology, but Weidman uses angle ring. Um, what this is doing is instead of a sharp 90 degree, you're forming that piece of insulation to be a, an appropriately designed radius. You can adjust the radii uh, to make sure that you are uh, controlling the stress in the best manner possible. Next. Uh, and you can see here, just by changing from a sharp 90 degree radius to using contoured, appropriately contoured, I should uh, clarify that, appropriately sized and appropriately contoured insulation pieces, we went from a 14% margin to a 31% margin, which is much, much safer. Generally, uh, you're looking for a minimum of 20 to 25% margin or greater, depending on what your uh, uh, into the needs are of the transformer, your voltage class, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of things to consider when doing this, but it should be considered to look at the contoured insulation um, because it can dramatically improve the reliability of the transformer. 
Next, please. Tom? Okay, so um, thank you, Brad and Jason, for uh, presenting some concepts to help for the design of, of liquid-filled transformers. Um, what I would like to do here with this slide is just kind of go through and, and summarize all of these key concepts. So we started out uh, talking about uh, the, the concept of key raw materials uh, or ingredients, um, craft pulp from boreal forests with high quality water are essential raw materials for the dielectric, mechanical, and thermal performance required for large power transformers. Again, uh, we are, as, as far as manufacturers of this material, there's no other additives that are included in the, in the, oper in the manufacturing. So you get these properties only by uh, having the right uh, raw materials. Um, the second concept is that by creping, which is putting these folds in the paper, uh, and then calendaring, so that now pressing those back out, uh, we can add to the, the strength and elongation of the paper and improve that so that while the, uh, the paper is, is wound onto the conductors themselves, they can be wound under high tension, uh, which allows you to have uh, an improved space factor in, in your winding. Space factor, I'm not sure I defined that earlier, but Space, when you're looking at designing a transformer winding, uh, ideally you want to put as much copper into the winding space as you can. Or conversely, the, knowing how much copper you need uh, as far as carry, uh, being able to carry the current, uh, you can make the winding smaller by, by having a smaller space factor. So if you imagine doing that on the inner winding, uh, that's going to then even be more amplified on the outer winding. So you can you can make some significant improvements in the overall size of the transformer by uh, having uh, using this uh, calendared uh, crate conductor insulation. Um, the next uh, concept uh, that Brad presented um, was the the concept of uh, using spacer material to control axial short circuit forces. Um, the ideal spacer would be uh, purely elastic, which means that uh, after the winding sees this very strong short circuit force, that the spa all the spacer materials go back to their original thickness. That there's no set in the material. So this reversible uh, compressibility that Brad showed uh, was uh, around 85% with these milled spacers. Again, ideally a purely elastic material would be 100%, but you significantly uh, improve that by removing the screen pattern, uh, which then allows these transformer windings to withstand multiple short circuit events. And not every time it sees a short circuit that the spacers get more and more and more compressed. Uh, so the next uh, concept is the, um, the concept of lower relative permittivity. Um, so when you look at the, the oil uh, paper dielectric system, the, the strength of the oil is much lower than the strength of the press board by probably five to one. So what ideally you want to do is, is to put more of the, the electric stress into the solid insulation. And one way that you can achieve, achieve that is to, if the solid insulation has a lower relative permittivity. If that perm, relative permittivity approaches the relative permittivity of the liquid, then more of the stress will be transferred uh, from the liquid to the solid, um, which, is, um, which is more capable of of handling it. So particularly in high-low spaces and uh, between the phases, we call it phase-to-phase -phase barriers, um, we can optimize that by using uh, the lower density press board, what uh, Brad showed as high valve, uh, and in that case uh, we can uh, we can reduce the high-low and phase-to-phase -phase space 
and still use this barrier concept. Um, okay, so the next is um, this concept of the barriers themselves. So um, Jason referred to the to the Weidman reference curves. The concept of that is that the smaller that the liquid gap is, the oil gap, then the, the higher the strength is. So if you can take uh, any any liquid gap and break it into smaller subgaps through the introduction of barriers, then you can get a small smaller overall clearance. And if I take that concept and add it to what Brad presented about the lower relative permittivity, if I use lower density board for those barriers, as I mentioned before, then I can get even more of an improvement. So subdividing the gaps, using as thin of a board as you can, and then using that board if, for low, if it's low density board um, is, is the most optimal way to do it. And then there's another stress that, uh, that uh, the insulation designer has to consider, and that is the interfacial stress, the stress along the surface of the insulation. Um, Jason uh, also called that creep stress. And we see that most uh, uh, relevant uh, at the end of the winding. Um, so uh, Jason showed the, this concept of uh, uh, insulation design analysis where we looked at equipotential lines and we know that those will, will bend uh, at, at the end of the winding. And if we can form our insulation barriers so that they conform to those equipotential lines, then we reduce the amount of surface stress uh, on the board. So if using contoured uh, transform board insulation, uh, what Jason mentioned, we call angle rings, uh, and then a, and that's one way, and then cap rings is the other way, uh, we can lower the, the interfacial stress. So that's, uh, that's the summary of the, of the concepts. Uh, the last thing I wanna say is that these are concepts uh, it's it's difficult to apply these uh, uh, in and of themselves, um, but uh, Weidman, uh, our engineering teams at Weidman uh, will utilize these concepts as well as others that, that we didn't cover today to optimize the insulation design uh, of your transformer and um, that uh, these are services that, that we can provide. Um, so I think uh, the the value that that hopefully uh, those of you on the call can see is is perhaps you can use these uh, when you're um, when you're specifying your transformer, particularly looking at the raw materials and how the the insulation design can be analyzed, and then transformer manufacturers hopefully can take advantage of some of these concepts to uh, make a more economical design. Um, so I saw Francis come back in to the picture and uh, I think that's the clue for the question and answer session. So hopefully we've received a lot of questions and answers. I, I know um, that, uh, that uh, I had some um, that folks that uh, has a preview of this have sent us as well. So, Francis, I'm going to let you take well, over. We, we certainly have a lot of questions, so I do hope you have the answers, actually. Um, but um, yeah, first of all, thank you very much, Brad, Jason, Tom, for a, a really interesting presentation with some optimization concepts. Um, it seems like uh, the audience appreciated it and have certainly sent a lot of questions. So I will try and get through as many as I can. So just the first note, you will receive a recording of the presentation and also um, copies of the, the slide deck. So for those asking that question, I think we've answered that straight away. Let's jump in straight away with a question about the uh, degree of polymerization. So we talked about degree of polymerization being dependent on the species of, of trees and the pulping process. Um, we referred specifically to softwood and boreal trees. Um, if, you know, basically the question is when insulation is made all over the world, if it's 
produced using different types of pulp or different types of trees, pulping methods? How do you determine um, the degree of polymerization for, for those um, specifics? So, yeah, thanks. Good question. Um, so the degree of polymerization is the, the, the length of the, the chemical length of the cellulose molecule. The cellulose molecule is, is fairly a simple molecule. It's made up by a chain of individual monomers um, that are tied together with with uh, OH bonds. Um, the test itself is actually a viscosity test where you take the, the the cellulose, whether it's in pulp form or in a paper board form, you dissolve it in a solvent according to the standard, and then you measure the viscosity of the solvent. As you can imagine, if you have a longer chain, it'll be a more viscous, thicker fluid. Uh, so there's a correlation that, that's done for that. Um, we we at Weidman measure the degree of polymerization on the raw materials that, that we use. So as as has been stated, starting with slower slower growth uh, softwood trees, you end up with a starting degree of polymerization in the pulp form of around 1,200 to 1,600. And then it, it will go down as you make your, your board making process. Um, some of other trees, like if you were looking at the, the degree of polymerization of hardwood trees, um, that's, that's a lower number, somewhere down around 1,000 to start. OK. Thank you, Tom. We have, um, we have a few short questions. I'm hoping you can answer them equally uh, short. So one is on the topic of oil absorption. Is that a percentage of the volume or weight? Brad, I'll let you. I'll jump in here. Um, so oil absorption is measured by weight. So okay. weighing the sample before and after the oil absorption. Great, thank you. Um, what is the optimal dielectric stress stress strength with press paper? Uh, I'll, I'll hop in on that. That's not a simple answer to to do, unfortunately. There are a lot of factors that go into uh, the optimal strength. It depends on the design, the the arrangement of windings, the clearances you have, how how safe the end user feels about things. Some end users prefer a little more robust design. Um, it depends on material utilization, cleanliness of of the factory, accuracy of manufacturing. So it's not a simple must be this number versus this number. Um, it, there's a lot that goes into it. So quick quick question without a, a defined answer, unfortunately. Thanks, Jason. Um, how prevalent is methanol assessment with regards to determining paper life expectancy? <laughs> I'll take that one. Uh, so methanol is, is uh, so there's, if you're looking at a transformer that's in service, uh, we try to measure the insulation life by this degree of polymerization that I described earlier. Um, the challenge is that if you have a transformer in service, you're not able to get a sample of the of the paper press board from the location that you want to test to do this viscosity measurement. So there's what's called markers in the oil. So as the paper starts to depolymerize to age, um, some of the byproducts of the paper will end up dissolving in the oil. The most common test for that is, is called furans, is a bunch of furan compounds that you can measure and correlate back to the DP. Uh, that has some challenges with some interference, uh, and there's been some recent work done on methanol. Methanol is another degradation product from the cellulose. It's, it's, our, our industry is, is fairly slow moving. I mean, this methanol measurement has been around for more than 20 years, but in the transformer industry, I would call it in its infancy. So a lot of research, most of it coming out of uh, Hydro-Quebec um, and IREC, which is their research facility. But uh, I know uh, of two labs anyways in the US that, are me that can measure methanol and give you an estimation of paper degradation. Okay, thanks, Tom. Brad, we have a question relating to slide 18. 
Um, I don't know if you want to go to slide 18 and I'll ask another quick question while you do that. Um, we've had a lot of questions about Esther. Have we done the same studies with Esther? Um, so we've had a, a, a few comments. So the use of Esther fluid may have different strengths. Will we comment on the effect of that? Um, and we had, um, uh, yeah, a number of a number of questions around ester, synthetic and, and natural esters, uh, and specifically, can we consider high permeativity of oil for stress calculations? Um, I don't know if someone can answer that one. Yes, I'll, I'll jump in here first and just comment that that esters, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, have different relative permittivity values than mineral oil. Um, so these, the numbers that were shown here were strictly for mineral oil. Uh, and obviously exchanging the insulating liquid will adjust um, those accordingly, both the, the relative permittivity of the oil or the liquid as well as the solid. Um, and then these analysis would have to be done with those, those values. Okay, and my, my Maybe I can just... with that, Brad, is that we don't necessarily publish that data. That is something that we're currently working with individual OEMs on their specific design to provide a service to mm -hmm. to um, give that information or share that information with, with customers that they can contact us for more details on, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Maybe yes. if, if ahead, I can Tom. just add one thing. If you go to the slide before that, um, so we looked at the the or the one before that, please. So the the we look at the property the the transform oil. This is mineral oil. We see a relative permittivity of 2.2 .2. uh, for an ester, say a natural ester fluid. That relative permittivity is 3.1. So uh, whoever had the question probably maybe knew that, but in that case, ideally you would have the same relative permittivity between the liquid and the solid. So certainly 3.1 3 is much better than 2.2. So in that case, we're able to put more of the stress in the solid insulation uh, because we have a higher relative permittivity liquid. And if, if, when we share this um, presentation, there's some references. Um, so there was there was a paper that, uh, that actually I wrote um, um, and it's in the references that talk about that. Okay, Tom, and just one one particular specific as you're talking about that, um, about replacing mineral oil with natural ester. With the higher permeativity, and it's therefore closer to that of paper, is there an advantage or disadvantage relating to it's that? It's an advantage. Okay. It's an advantage because the whether it's ester liquid or transformer oil, the, the, the liquid is the weaker uh, dielectric. So by by having esters with a higher permittivity, you're able to move the electric stress into the solid insulation. So okay. it, it's definitely an advantage. Thank you. And then if we go back to slide 18, Brad, the specific question there was how do we consider the RZ or uh, RZ for the American translation <laughs> um, as the uh, geometry, not axis symmetry? How do you consider the model as the geometry, not axis symmetry? Uh, Jason, I'll actually let you yep. take that on the idea as the idea expert. Yeah. So, so axisymmetric versus uh, RZ for for everybody else there. Uh, it's rotational in this case. What you're doing is you're picking the center of the the core leg, which is not shown in this imagery. And I don't know who can see the camera, but if you have a core leg center and a coil especially in, in a core form style format, they are round. Uh, in this instance, what we're doing is rotating it um, as opposed to a planar axis, axisymmetric or planar, which would be as if it's two infinitely long parallel planes. Okay, thank you. Um, question about the use of paper by manufacturers. So after Weidman produces our paper, it's exported to a variety of manufacturers. Who control the installation process? Do we have any recommendations on, on how an end user may be able to determine that the insulation materials are applied correctly in the transformer design? Yeah, I, I guess I can take that. Um, um, I, 
if if I was our rec my recommendation or the Wyman recommendation for anyone buying a transformer is that you should work very closely with your manufacturer. Um, you can, uh, to the highest degree, you can have a very detailed specification in which you specify specific raw materials that are utilized. Um, and then um, I would recommend that you have uh, either, either qualify the manufacturing plant or if it's a very, you know, some of these million, multi-million dollar transformers, you actually do inspections of the unit as it's being manufactured. Um, it's uh, it, that that would be the most reliable way to make sure that um, that uh, you're getting you know a high quality transformer. And I'm sure there's if if you don't have the the expertise in house, you know use a use a consultant. Um, but to have someone that that understands the manufacturing process, and and then visual you know go on site and view these uh, critical manufacturing processes. And one of which would be, you know, winding coils. Okay, thank you. Um, we we had a couple of people asking about the Weidman reference curves and whether we could clarify number one to four for the curves. So I'm not sure if you can, if you can, you can head to there. But while we do that, Tom, I have a quick question for you that came in. So the dielectric strength of paper, according to the standard, um, depending on density and air permeability, is determined in air. How can you find out what the dielectric strength of paper that's been treated with oil is? Uh, there's, I mean, we we, we publish uh, strength curves in, in oil as well. Um, but the and, and Jason talked to this a little bit at the first question about what the strength is of insulation materials. It's it's it's. It's very di it's difficult in that uh, you have to understand that the, the strength is measured according to a standard in a laboratory, and that strength is very dependent on the test method itself. Uh, in Brad's lab, he has different electrodes according to whether it's an IEC or an ASTM standard, uh, and then also there's as this uh, question mentioned, there's tests that are done in air. There's also tests that are done in oil. And in most cases, the results are very tightly related to the electrodes uh, themselves. So uh, what you measure in, in a, a test according to a standard isn't exactly what you would apply when you're designing the transform. But to finally come back to the original question, that you should not use strength in air uh, for, for a for designing a power transformer. And so they, they, I know it, for the Weidman materials, we have tests in oil and, and, and oil-based criteria. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, Brad, you want to comment on one, two, three, and four in the Weidman curve slash line? Uh, I, I can handle that one, actually. Um, the, the one, two, three, and four refer to the four different Weidman reference curves for oil gaps. Um, you're looking at insulated degassed oil, technically clean oil on an insulated surface. You're looking at not uninsulated degassed oil. You're then looking at insulated gas saturated, i.e. in operation for many years without processing, uh, and then uninsulated gas saturated oils. So, so bare electrodes uh, would be defined as uninsulated uh, to, to a degree. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. And and we are going to have to wrap this up by, right. uh, shortly. I apologize that there are so many questions still coming in, and we will try and answer all of these offline. Of course, we have um, a couple of questions um, relating specifically to Nomex. One of them, of course, comes from our friend Radek at DuPont. Um, but I wanted to ask so a couple of things. Would you advise if it would be an advantage or disadvantage if changing the insulation to Nomex, maintaining the topology and geometry? Was one question from outside of DuPont. So um, there's been a lot of studies, and we've actually published in 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 some of our transformer board books. Um, Comparing uh, if we go to the stability of a transformer winding, 
one of the properties that Brad uh, discussed and I reiterated in the summary uh, was the importance of how elastic the material is and that the radial spacers that Brad showed had um, by removing the surface pattern on a cellulose spacer, you were able to approach 85% reversible compressibility. That That is even much better, uh, well over 90% uh, with Nomex spacer material. So uh, for short circuit strength in, in, a, in a transformer winding, um, a Nomex spacer is, is better. And the Nomex conductor wrap as well, um, because it's uh, the, such a high thermal class of the Nomex, um, you won't get any aging of that wrap, which causes it to, to, to shrink uh, over, over its lifetime. So uh, using Nomex within the winding itself will allow you to have a much more stable winding uh, over, over the life of the unit. And, and along those, or at least along the lines of high temperature, Tom, um, there's a report, a question here that some studies show that esters can improve thermal performance of cellulose by 20 degrees, but Weidman studies show it's closer to 10 degrees. Can you can you comment quickly on that high temperature topic, please? Um, yeah, I can. I mean, I think that the whoever asked the question uh, showed uh, we we've done some recent studies. Um, Actually, significant amount of uh, of the research we've done and published over the last five years has been on aging studies uh, with different ester manufacturers, and consistently what we're seeing is that if you in a sealed tube aging test, a laboratory test, uh, if you use ester rather than mineral oil, uh, you get a 10 degree better uh, thermal class of the solid insulation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just a uh, question still coming in, but we will uh, we will just ask a couple more and then we will wrap this up on the on the hour. Um, quick question on thermally upgraded paper. Apart from the thermal stability, does it have any superior dielectric or mechanical properties as well? That's easy. No. OK, thank you for that quick answer. Um, da, 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 let me uh, question about offshore wind turbine transformers relating to solid insulation. Do we recommend a vibration test for that? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, I mean, we we Weidman would not directly uh, influence that because like, we're we're the supplier of the insulating material. My only comment is that you know, if you go back to what Brad's um, presentation was, uh, I, I would recommend, particularly if you have spacer material, that it's this milled spacer material. And then uh, going back to what DuPont had mentioned, uh, I think even uh, if you wanted even better uh, material for your winding, it, you could use a Nomex uh, insulation. Okay. Thank you very much. I think given the time, we will leave it there for today. We have a lot of unanswered questions, but we will um, work out how to distribute those between the, the, the three presenters and hopefully be able to provide you all with answers. Um, finally, I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us. It's uh, great to see so many people and so much interaction. We, we really enjoy uh, these sessions and we will be back. Um, we will keep you all informed of the next section. If you have specific topics that you think may be interesting um, for the wider audience, please feel free to drop us an email and we will put them in a long list of, uh, of ideas and recommendations we've received. And with that, I would like to thank you all for joining us. Wish you an excellent continuation of your day wherever you are in the world as we have people from from all major continents on here today. So thank you very much from Weidman Electrical. If you need any further information or would like to speak to Tom, Jason or Brad about a specific issue or our engineering services available, then please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.